Well, everyone, welcome. My name is Elisa Banks. I'm on the membership committee of the Surface Design Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this week's Textile Talk, talking about books. Textile Talks are weekly seminars, uh, weekly webinars brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, the Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and the Surface Design Association. SDA is an international organization that promotes awareness and, and appreciation of textile-inspired art and design through its journal, publications, in-person and online exhibitions, and conferences. SDA sponsors several active regional groups and maintains an active presence on social media. I invite you to visit the SDA website to view a variety of exhibitions, view member portfolios and learn details about our calls for entry, many of which are open to both members and non-members. And of course, new members are always welcome. This webinar would not be possible without the support of our sponsors, Artistic Artifacts, Arafil, CNT Publishing, eQuilter.com, Handy Quilter, Misty Fuse, Mode of Fabrics, Nine Patch Fabrics, Schiffer Publishing, thequiltshow.com, Quilt Mania, and Empty Spool Seminars. Please consider these generous sponsors when making your next purchases. And now for a few housekeeping announcements. Throughout this webinar, your screens and mics are not showing. Please submit your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Use the Q&A for questions in the chat box for greeting others, for technical help, and to answer the survey. We are honored to bring you free and inspiring textile talks programming and respectfully ask that you be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and presenters and other participants. Your chat comments can be seen by everyone. And if you prefer not to see chat notifications, you can click the chat button at the bottom of your screen to toggle on and off. And now for our presentation. When the idea of this episode came up, I knew I wanted to invite our two guests whose work I've admired for a while and I'm thrilled to introduce them to you today. Annie Lopez has been an active member of the Phoenix, Arizona art scene since 1982 and has consistently created new bodies of narrative work exploring a variety of subjects. Her art reflects her experiences through the use of family photographs, vintage found photos, personal letters and short stories. In her work, Annie presents a dialogue about racism, stereotypes, the local art world, personal relationships, and family. She is most known for her use of cyanotype and archival photographic printing process. The images Annie uses and, her state, and the statements she makes through her art continue to evolve. Annie engages the viewer with photographs, print, storytelling, and dresses made of paper, which often make poignant statements with a sense of humor. Annie has exhibited her work in numerous venues across the nation, including the Smithsonian Institution, the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, the Museum of Fine Arts in Santa Fe, Shelburne Museum in Vermont, and the Worcester Museum in, um, in Massachusetts. Worcester Art Museum, excuse me. She was the first Arizona artist selected to present the state, to represent the state in the exhibition Paper Roots, Women to Watch 2020 at the National Museum of Women and the Arts in Washington, DC. Rhiannon Skye Tafoya is an indigenous artist who is from the Eastern Band, Cherokee, and Santa Clara Pueblo tribes. Her tribal heritage and lineage are significant components that are, continuous, that con are continuously present within her work. Skye has worked in both two-dimensional and three-dimensional forms ranging in sizes from handheld to life-size. She creates work using serigraph and letterpress printmaking and through paper cutting, paper weaving, and bookmaking. Her work and designs are influenced by basketry and contains themes of cultural teachings, Cherokee language preservation, and personal and family narratives. Sky creates with the intention of preserving and sharing stories, language, culture, and experiences. She first published, she published her first artist book, Omegit, in the spring of 2020 and has displayed work nationally in California, Georgia, Ohio, Oregon, Nevada, New Mexico, New York, and internationally in Russia. Sky received her BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and her MFA from the Pacific Northwest College of Art in Portland, Oregon. 
And finally, yours truly. My name is Elisa Banks, and my work ex uh, explores identity politics through the lenses of home, terrain, and the body, and includes fibers and found materials that reference traditional craft techniques such as twisting, knotting, crocheting, and sewing to create sculptural and textile-based work. Using Southern Louisiana as a point of entry, my practice investigates connections to contemporary culture and the African diaspora. I am particularly interested in the performative and sensorial potential of the book through narratives that explore multiple identities. My work has been exhibited in North America, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and is in several private and public collections, including the Smithsonian Institute, the US Library of Congress, and the New York Public Library. And since we're talking about books today, it might be a good idea to just kind of frame it a little bit. What is an artist's book? Well, which you'll probably notice in the next few slides is that our work speaks to the book format without mimicking the traditional form. And the artist of a dish, the definition of an artist book is in constant flux. But for the purposes of this talk, a book is a method of communication, but there are many ways to communicate. If we consider a text that takes as its origin an oral history, the origin of the story or the communication is actually the, 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 the verbal word. And so what other ways might one share information? A quilt, a taste, a basket, or a dress? A book, or specifically an artist book, can transcend the physical both in terms of meaning and material. And with that, everything can be a book, and an artist book explores that potential. And with that idea, let's see and hear a bit about each of our work. And after we hear a little bit of, about each of our work, we'll enter, we'll have a little conversation, and then we'll have a brief time, a time for brief Q and A. All right. So we'll start first with first with Annie. Hi there. Um, let's see. Naturalized citizens is a piece that I made. Uh, it, that includes all of my maternal grandparents naturalization papers. They came into Arizona uh, from Mexico in 1919. And um, it's always been my civic duty to, to educate people on Arizona and Mexico. We're neighbors, um, Mexicans come and go. We, uh, um, uh, the United States, took part of Mexico. So we were included in the, in this state. Uh, it's, it's, that's just part of everything that I do is I'm just teaching people that um, Mexico, Arizona was part of Mexico at one time and uh, we're just, we are neighbors. But these papers um, are just proving how long my family has been here in Arizona. Um, they, they are naturalization papers, papers I had to apply to, to the INS. It took six months and me proving that they were, um, they had died in the seventies, uh, but it, I had to prove that. I had to prove my connection to them. And then, um, but uh, th this dress is um, made of paper. It is cyanotype on, printed on tamale wrapper paper. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, I'm sure. Um, but it's all paper sewn just like you would a regular dress. There's a zipper, a working zipper in it. There is a, a belt that goes with it. But this piece, um, I'd never seen these papers before. And it was an education for me also to learn about my grandparents through these papers. Next, please. Uh, Remnants of Long-Term Memory is um, a story about my father who eventually died of Alzheimer's. Um, I'm the one that was his closest give, caregiver. I took care of him every day. I, um, he had a business that I worked at with him. I would take him to work every day. And in the last year of his life, I would put paper under him and I'd give him a, a pen and ask him to write up an invoice for a customer. And, you know, just trying to work his memory. He didn't remember much, but he remembered his name and he wrote it exactly as he did all the time that I knew him. Um, his name was Frank. He made a little doodle on it, and which kind of looks like a dog, maybe wearing a hat. Uh, other people said it looks like a grocery cart, but it's his doodle. He used to doodle for um, my brothers and sisters and I when we were kids. 
Um, that was just something that he did. So he was artistic. This is probably where I got it from. He was also an auto upholsterer. That, um, so th that leans into my uh, selling um, my artwork. Um, he, uh, these are the only things that he knew that he could write. And in there, there's, um, you'd have to find it. I don't know where it's at in there, but he remembered my name. Um, he didn't remember anybody else, including my mother but he remembered me because I took care of him so closely every day. And it, my name is written in there. I'm pretty sure that's what he meant. It says A-N-N-E-E. -E. Um, yeah, you can kind of see it in the front by the seam in the front at below at the bottom. Um, but he did remember my name and that I'll always hold on to that. But um, again, this is a dress made out of paper, zippers, there's buttons, but uh, yeah. Next one, please. Oops, there you go. Ah. Um, this is official proof. This dress is made um, again on paper. Uh, the images on it are my official proof that I've been in Arizona such a long time. My family's been in Arizona such a long time. I'm fourth generation and, um, and still have to battle with people who, you know, think I don't belong here for some reason. Uh, my birth certificate is on it. Um, there's like, you see music memory awards. There's awards from grade school, from catechism when I was in grade school, campfire girls. Um, all this is um, my official proof that I belong here, that uh, my family has been here a very long time. In Arizona, we've um, had a lot of uh, politicians who moved more recently to Arizona and, uh, and so uh, are always constantly battling immigration. You know, we don't need any more people, they think. Um, but, you know, I was here before you were, and that's what I try to remind people of. <laughs> I, I've been here since uh, I was born, and, but I'm fourth generation. But the, all of this is my proof that I did all of these things before a lot of those people even moved into the state. And that's why I call it official proof. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is, uh, I wish I were bulletproof. This is um, made exactly like uh, a police officer's outer carrier bulletproof vest would be like. I am um, currently working as a seamstress because I don't like to be in my studio all day. I, don't, I would be a hermit if I could, but so I like to be out and working. And I work in a, in a, a store that's, that sells police uniforms, public service, sheriff's office, that sort of thing. So I see these things every day. And I knew that I wanted to make a vest exactly like um, an outer carrier, which this is. It is made of paper again, and it's got Velcro closings, just like the real bulletproof vest would be. But once I started working in, the, in this line this as a seamstress, um, I. I knew that I wanted to make this because I always felt like I needed some sort of protection myself. And that's why there are images of me all over this vest because I wish I were bulletproof for sure. Um, these are all, you know, growing up, high school, that sort of thing. Um, but it is, it is made just like a regular vest and it's my protection. But that's the way I see it. Next, please. And this is a very recent dress. It was just made last fall. This is called Relative Aliens. Um, it is about my, my maternal grandparents again. These are, the skirt is made up of their um, naturalization cards. Their, their alien identification cards actually is what they're called. We're aliens, so I am, I am an alien, that makes me an alien too. I'm related to aliens. So I'm, you know, from outer space. That's what it seems like to me. Uh, just that term is just so awful and needs to be eliminated. But at the time in 1919, there, it was an alien identification card. Um, that's what the skirt is made of. At the top, it is a law that came into effect in Arizona, um, SB 1070, which is the show us your papers law. And uh, just seems so appropriate to me. It's like, here's my papers. And that's, that's the way I, 
I use my artwork as just like, here's my papers. Um, it's my artwork. It shows you how long my family has been here in Arizona. But that law um, is, is on the, I intentionally put it on the top of the dress. It's a halter dress, which ties around the neck, which is to me like strangling, which is the law, what the law seems to me. And it's still in effect the part where uh, any law enforcement officer can, can stop you for any reason and ask to see your papers to prove that you're here legally, which is ridiculous. Um, Cause that means you couldn't even visit. Uh, so that's what, that's the wording that's on the top of the law. So everything is, um, the, the patterns that I choose are kind of intentional. They're, they're found accidentally. I don't go looking for these patterns that I use there, but when I find what I need, what I feel fits the topic of the dress, that's when I sew it into the form that it, that it ends up being. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. It's fabulous. Okay, we'll hear a few, a little bit from Sky. Hi, um, this is my artist book called Olnigid. It is um, made of a lot of different materials. Um, the front cover is handmade paper and then the back cover on the right side that you see is handwoven paper um, made from color print paper. Uh, next, please. So with this book, it was speaking a lot about my, my memories of my maternal grandmother, but also speaking to my unborn child who was in my stomach at the time. He's also my first child and probably my last one, most likely my last one. Um, but this design was created um, from me, kind of just signifying the links between me, my grandmother, my mom, and then onto my child. And um, in the open format that you see on the right side is the, where the poetry lives. And so it closes up into an accordion fold, which on the left you can see is folded down. And this book mimics a basket because my, my grandmother was a basket weaver. And so when I first made the prototype to this book, I was, um, I just moved home. I had been away for probably about 14 years. And it was kind of just a way to um, get back in touch with her. I, had, I mean, she, she died when, uh, probably in 2004, 2004, and I moved back to Cherokee in 2018. And so it was a really long time and um, it was nice to reconnect with her in a way that kind of spoke to her um, literally in her language and also like um, through her weaving practices. And so this is kind of how this book came to be, uh, some of the ideas behind it. And so you can see that it does kind of open up into a basket. Uh, next, please. Here's another uh, photo of it. Um, I have some pretty great photos of it, but you know, it's, it's best to just see it in person. And I have, it is in a several collections, like at least 30 collections. So um, maybe we can link to something. If you guys are in the area of those collections, then you can go visit it. But this work really um, pushed me in more into my weaving practices. And I started creating just um, weavings made of paper and then kind of going forth with screen pre printing paper. Um, Alisa, you can go to the next slide, please. So it kind of comes into um, this form uh, when I go into like making more of wall pieces. So this is called Rhythmic and this piece was made just kind of talking about my, my labor experiences um, of having Otis. And so this is a uh, screen printed paper, the whole thing's screen printed and then it's all woven together. Um, but the, the motif, the cross motif, those all represent um, me, my partner and um, Otis, who is my son. And his uh, Cherokee name is Kanastai, which means strong arm. And so this piece right now is up at Echo Amano in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's my first solo show and um, it's pretty, all of it's dedicated to Kanostai, like his, um, 
his presence in my life, whether it was like within my stomach or, you know, coming out of me. But this um, was talking about his, um, all of the, the labor pains and like the way that I had to really get into a um, meditative, a meditative uh, place just to understand how all of these contractions have to go in such a rhythm to like push him out. Uh, next please. And then into contraction of just talking about <laughs> the contractions in my uterus and how how it was how uh, how hard it was for me. I was in labor for 60 plus hours so I had a really really tough time and kind of resulted in a very like scary birthing process and so this is kind of where I'm at like just using my experiences and my family lineages to talk about um, how we experience pain but how we get through everything as well I'm done <laughs> thank you sky yeah and congratulations on that show too this is great Thanks. It's up until August 23rd. If um, anyone's in Santa Fe for Indian Market, um, it'd be a really great time to go check that show out. Good deal. And we'll have a link to it also. Okay. So I, I wanted to show a couple of uh, my pieces. Uh, this one is called Edges. Um, and it's a series of four altered books. Each one has a, a unique hairstyle like along the edge, along the fore edge of the, uh, of the book, of the pages. And basically with these books, there is text on them, but the text is not very readable because depending on the, which, which one of the books, uh, you may or may not be able to read even part of the text. This one you can read a little bit, but you can't read them all because they're kind of squished together. But basically these are a set of Spanish language novels. And during the time there was a lot of um, dialogue about um, illegal immigration, which, you know, it's, it was very racialized um, dialogue. And this was back, I wanna say 2008 or 2009 or so. So, you know, it's the same conversation uh, some of the same conversations that we're hearing now, but it just so much reminded me of um, of the the language that was used in the 60s during uh, the civil rights era. That I just felt like there's there's nothing positive about or being said about other cultures or other cultures outside outside of mainstream culture. And so I wanted to speak to that in a book form. So I, um, I made uh, hairstyles, so to speak, on the edges of each of these pages. And I used um, textured black uh, synthetic hair in order to, um, to form the, the, uh, the hairstyles. This one is crocheted into a, a style called lace braid which is uh, basically a reference to an actual hairstyle. And I just wanted to show how much life and how much contributions um, uh, marginalized communities um, give towards uh, or affect mainstream culture and vice versa. So, you know, that one goes into the other, but, you know, they're kind of melded together how they kind of, um, how they affect each other. And I just wanted to speak to the liveliness and creativity that are, that are within the marginalized communities. Um, this is another piece. Um, it's one of my wall pieces. Um, I call them textile collages because uh, they, some of them are quilted or if they're quilted, they may not have the layering that a lot of people consider as quilts. So I call them textile collages, but I also consider these as book objects, book like objects. They definitely tell a story. They um, may or may not have a narrative uh, as far as actual text in them. Um, but this one kind of folds. It kind of looks like it's in the, the shape of a book, uh, a book that's opened up. And this particular one is about sharecropping. My dad grew up as the son of a sharecropper. And um, it's kind of what his feelings were about that growing up under that system. And then finally, since I talk about the performative um, aspect of books, I'm really interested in how, how the, the viewer responds to the work. And this is a work called Fire. It's one of uh, books, one of a series of books based on the elements. 
And uh, for this one, the outside is uh, like wool, which is, used to be used as fire blankets. I think maybe some places they still do. Um, she's opening the colophon there, but when you open up the book, you have the colors of fire. So there's the, the reddish part of the fire, the orange part, and then it gets down to reddish and then bluish, and then you've got white, and then you've got the ash, and then there's a little nugget there at the end after the piece has been consumed. Um, and I, for this one, I was very um, concerned about what types of materials I use and how the viewer went through the work. So this is the main story of the work. And it's a, it's a story about um, uh, going through uh, being at a school or attending a school that was undergoing integration, going through. And so the story is, you know, hot. <laughs> it's kind of, it's very um, transformative as far as I went in as an innocent third grader. And at the end of the school year, you know, I was different, so to speak. So here it goes, there's the ash, and then there's the little um, paper rock. And it says, love is greater than a distillation of words. So there are several stories within this series of books. Each one has a, has a set of stories. The school integration, and then another transformative event, which was for me, parenthood. And so um, that's that was, all of that is in the transfer, the transformation that's associated with fire. And then the materials, the, the book, I, I kind of wanted to make sure that the materials felt a certain way. That scroll is super, super soft on the side that the viewer handles it. Uh, the time that they take to roll the scroll back up is kind of a time for contemplation. And then she's just gonna go ahead and and close the book up. But that's kind of what I mean by the performative aspect of a book. And so that's that's my work. And so I'm going to stop sh screen sharing and we can start our talk. There we go. Okay. So I um I thought I had a I had a couple of um couple of questions I'll just throw out for our conversation. But because this is about we're talking about books here. I just want to um, send out as the first question, how does the notion or concept of book inform your work? And uh, I say, sky is next to me, so I'll go ahead and <laughs> <laughs> next to me on my screen here. <laughs> um, well, I'm just obsessed, obsessed with the artist book as a medium. Uh, when I first encountered it and learned of book artists, I was just, you know, I was, wow, there's like, even that, I've never seen that before. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen your book. And uh, I think it is like the performative thing. Like you get to interact and understand that each piece has like a difference, um, has a section to fit into another section to then get into another piece. And it's like unraveling almost like unraveling like a history and a story and feelings like everything you know um I think that that's why I'm most influenced by it it was really hard for me to start to make artist books mine were really small pop-up books when I first started and then I went into like a really large scale pop-up book that was human sized wow uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> but only it was very special because when, like I said, when I went home, I needed to find a way to connect with my grandmother. And that just felt like the right way to go. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to make, I don't know how to make traditional material baskets. Um, I do in my other culture, because um, my dad's a basket maker. So I used mm -hmm. to make baskets with him. However, when I was a kid, I, I never made baskets with my grandmother. I was just around her. And so um, I guess with the book, I just, you get down to the basic, um, the basic uh, idea of a book is that it just sh shares stories, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what I'm doing with my work. And so it it kind of just falls right into it, and the artist book just elevates it. Yeah, I, I like the way that you know if you read a book, you might read about all these different elements, but then in an artist book, you can actually sometimes have that element. That's really yeah. That's what pulled me into the <laughs> story. <laughs> now, Annie, I know uh -huh. that you're, you're um, mostly um, 
um, exhibit your work in photographic um, exhibitions. And but when I saw your dresses, which is the first the first works that I saw of yours, I immediately thought of book. So how do you, I mean, and I think, I think that you are thinking something about the narrative quality of a book, if I'm not mistaken, but I'll let you, I'll let you explain. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And I so appreciate that you could see that in my work. Um, I am a frustrated writer is what it is. And um, that's how I got out of the straight up photography is that I needed to say something in the work and just a, just a, a straight print. I could put some type on it, some, you know, and go into Photoshop and type all over it, but that's not what I wanted. Um, but I, I'm, I was constantly writing stories about my family, uh, my experiences, and I wanted a way to present them. And, um, uh, and because, you know, I picked up this, this uh, photographic printing uh, process that's that's where I started using text in that I started writing stories putting little bits and pieces of stories into each piece and with the dress um, to me it's just surrounding myself in um, uh, in the story and that's what I've always wanted to do it's just like I live in this story that's going on currently and also my my history my family history is is part of this and um, and that's kind of how I see it is that, you know, I always wanted to, to write. And um, strangely enough, a long time ago, I, you know, I was taking creative writing classes because, um, you know, artists need to learn how to write about their artwork. Uh, you have to, you know, uh, defend it at times. You have to uh, explain it at times. And um, so uh, I thought, well, okay, I'll get this creative writing certificate that um, you know, at this, at the at junior college around here, I uh, gotten straight A's and all the, the writing classes and all my teachers are saying, oh, I'm going to send this to my editor and stuff. And it's like, so I applied for the creative writing certificate and the head of the department turned me down. Oh. And I said, what, why? And they said, we didn't think that you could be creative enough. <laughs> I was already established as an artist. And she said, I didn't think you could be creative enough, but I live off of that sort of stuff. If you're going to tell me that I can't do it, I'm going to do it, you know, um, and that's what artists do. You know, we prove everybody else wrong. We're going to figure out a way to get to that point that we want, you know, we're, that we're trying to make or, uh, and that's what I do. But yeah, I love, I love to wrap myself in these stories and that's where the dress shape came from. So mm -hmm. I like that. I like that idea wrapping yourself in the story. I mean, quilts kind of do that too, but yes. a dress, I never considered that. And then when you talked about the halter dress, mm -hmm. about the why you selected that, that shape, that style, makes total sense. Yeah, each piece is, is um, uh, the, the, uh, the style of the dress, there's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. um, it has to kind of like match the story, the era, um, and, you know, it just, there is, there is, um, uh, sometimes there, I found dresses that I, uh, dress patterns that I used when I was a kid, when I was like 12 years old and I made a dress to wear to whatever. And I, I have gone, you know, to secondhand stores and found the actual pattern and made a dress out of that and just, you know, connected it to whatever story it was. But um, it just brings back these really great memories for me. Nice. I really, also really love that um, the dress is so beautiful each one are like, like, no one would assume that all of these stories are wrapped with, you know, within this dress, but you get to pull in your audience viewer and really get people to take a closer look at your garment. Right, it's like uh, yeah. forcing them to come in and, mm -hmm. and look closer and to read what's going on. And, and thank the, you. And the Santa type blue is just magnificent. I, I love yeah, that. that's beautiful. Yeah, and I thank was you. wondering, um, there's a pattern on um, the bottom left of the dress of official proof. And uh -huh. I was wondering if you could talk a lot, a little bit about that design. It's really, it's really gorgeous. And I, I just love the pattern. I love patterns a lot. I'm um, going to share the screen and see yeah, if you can bring it too. up. Let's see. It's, 
kind of thinking. Oops, got busy there. Let's see. Official. <laughs> there we go. There we go. There. Oh, are you talking about this guy uh, right here? Yeah. I believe that. About? Yeah. Wow, you saw that. Um, <laughs> I, I believe that came from Campfire Girls. That looks like that probably what that pattern is. Um, because everybody uh, use their, uses their own sort of like uh, designs in, in their certificates that would, they, they would give out. Uh -huh. And I believe that it's for a particular function. I'll have to find that out, go, you know, open up my files here and look, look at that dress. And, uh, but yeah, I believe that's a, a Campfire Girl certificate, but good eyes. <laughs> <laughs> what were you thinking? Were you thinking anything specific about that sky or were you? campfire girl or <laughs> I was not a <laughs> I, it just look yeah it just looked like it leans toward a Native American sort of um, pattern. Uh -huh. yeah that, it's really beautiful thank you it is yeah I'm gonna stop this now okay yeah so that's that's really interesting and Sky the basket um the basket that book that you made on on again uh, the, the actual weaving of it, is that a particular pattern or is that one that you created or? It's one that I created. Um, I've noticed that a lot of Cherokee basketry, they've stopped, like a lot of people who still make them, they use old designs. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure when like a, a new design has been made aside from what I'm doing, but I'm not putting it into traditional Cherokee basketry. Mm -hmm. um, kind of just doing my own thing with it. But I think it's crucial to keep making design, designs because it shows like how we evolve as people and how we adapt to our modern times and how we tell our stories too. Right. It's not. It's not just. It's not just your identity is based solely in the past. It's not right. like you stick. You you're in the past. You stayed in the past, and so you're kind of moving moving forward. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's real. Yeah. It's really beautiful how it's connecting her to her grandmother mm -hmm. too. I love mm -hmm. that because you're you're thinking of that person as you're doing this, and and I know it's a it's a beautiful tribute to her yeah. that you're that you're doing this. It's yeah, it's she, like a living connection. Actually, like she's definitely has guided me in a sense where like I've gotten a lot of um, a lot of exposure from that book. It kind of like set my artistic practice off again, and also my artistic professionalism everything kind of just boosted everything and I definitely think she had a big part in it she's helping you along yeah I love that yeah and Annie you said sewing is um you mentioned that your grandfather right was a sewer your was it your grandfather your father my my father your he father auto, auto upholstery um my mother didn't really sew I, mm -hmm. and I didn't learn the sewing from from my father mm -hmm. um my mother when I was I think I was about eight years old, sent me and my older sister to a neighbor woman who taught us the domestic arts. She <laughs> taught us how to, how to um, embroider and, and to sew. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's stuck with me. It's, you know, it's just something that I continue to use. And um, my dad's sister always did a lot of sewing and it, that just kind of connected us also. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just something that I've done since I was eight years old, done, you know, mm -hmm. just sewing my own clothes or sewing whatever it is that I need and doing things, you know, sewing clothes for my younger sister and my nieces. And so it's just, it's just been something I've been doing all along, but I didn't put it into my artwork until probably about 10 years ago. I didn't, I didn't really connect the dots there. It just didn't go in that direction. It was all um, uh, two-dimensional prints mm -hmm. and I didn't, I hadn't even considered that I could make it into a three-dimensional sort of thing so so what what made you make that what helped you to make that connection um I was going through a hard time and this is when my father had just died and um it was just a little um the world was just a little bleak and tense and um having to deal with his estate or whatever uh which is you know his business that I had to you know it was just a lot of a lot of things and I had um, a solo show coming up at the um, Phoenix Art Museum because I'd won some award it's like um, emerging artists 
you know, it took me 30 years to be an emerging or, or a, no, no, this is a mid-career artist. I'd already got the emerging artist I'd got. So this is mid-career artist, so I could have a show there. And um, I was sitting down with the um, uh, curator and we were talking and she knew what was going on in my life. And she asked me how things were going. And I just said, you know, someday I'm gonna sell my troubles into a dress. I don't know why I said that, but I said that and she said, do it. And it's, it, you know, that's all I needed. Just that little push off the cliff, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes that's all you need. And um, so that's where it started. I knew, uh, you know, I had thought about using um, that paper in, in workshops. So that's what I was doing is using it in workshops because it's so easy to use and it's inexpensive. But I never thought um, to continue sewing it, you know, just making little flags and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think about making it into, you know, keep connecting more and more pieces together until it made a big piece of fabric that I could cut a dress out of it and sew it together. Mm -hmm. So uh, all I just needed was that little push, somebody to listen to my griping and say, you know, prove yourself, do it, go ahead, mm -hmm. you know. Nice. So were those, the smaller pieces, were they cyanotype or did that come later? Um, uh, the the prints that I was making? Yeah, the, right, your prints, I, were they? Yeah, I've been making cyanotype. I've been doing cyanotype since the mid 80s when I okay. learned it. I start, yeah, I started out, you know, just doing black and white and color photography, but I needed, I needed something different. I live in Arizona, I live in Phoenix, so it's always sunny. Today it's not, but mm -hmm. um, it's always sunny, so it's easy to make prints. And that's how you make cyanotype is out in the sun. You use the sun to make the prints and it just to me made more sense made connected it more to me also mm -hmm. so um about the um oh man oh never mind <laughs> <laughs> at least you had me at sat cyanotype i thought oh, that's that's really interesting but yeah i think it's I think it's really interesting how chance plays in the work. Like you were, you just said that all of a sudden, and then here you are with a whole new, I mean, it took you down another path and sky with your weaving, it took you down another path. Right. Mm -hmm. So how, and, and there's that connection. It's like the connect you start off one way. And then even though it's, it's in your mind, it's, it's within you somewhere. And then all of a sudden something happens and it comes out to the, Front, and then you you start working going down that path, which I, I really think is interesting. And, and um, Sky, you said that with the book, it kind of took you on another direction as well, right? The uh, the weaving. Were you weaving before you um, tried before you made Old Nigga? Or um, I was weaving baskets with my dad, mm -hmm. made out of red willow. I had tried paper weaving, I think. 2017 and I made some pretty good work um unfortunately it's lost in the mail one time oh. transporting things yeah but I wasn't um I wasn't very impressed it wasn't like fueling what I wanted at the time mm -hmm. um but it absolutely does now like I feel very addicted to my work like I want to come work every single day um and I I like that um any you didn't uh, necessarily like learn right from the source, but you did learn. And the same goes with me. It's like, I didn't learn from the source. And I was speaking with a friend recently and we want to collaborate and he's a bead worker. And he also is a bead worker because his grandmother was a bead worker, although mm -hmm. he didn't learn directly from the source. And it's like thinking about inheriting these talents, but not directly. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really beautiful. And I, I wonder to you, Elisa, like, how does, how do you feel about that? And does it come through in your work? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I, my family, my grandmother quilted, I'm sure her mother quilted. Um, I did, I didn't learn quilting. I wasn't around my grandmother very, for very long. Uh, we lived, we moved around a lot. My dad was in the military. And so uh, we would visit when we could. But um, her quilting left quite an impression on me, as did my, um, my aunt's sewing. And so I didn't, like you, I didn't learn from the source. My mom taught me to, how to sew, and I sewed since I was, I don't know, 
uh, sixth grade or something like that. And, and eventually I made my own clothes too and tell you know, that's not a cool thing to do anymore. <laughs> I want store-bought clothes. <laughs> and so, you know, I didn't think about it at all. When I did pick up art again, it was painting. And I just ran across a book one day of G's Ben Quilters and it just, it connected me back to that, that feeling. And, and you're right, when, when you create um, from that, from that you, you forge that connection. And that, basically that's what I think we're doing it by, um, by working in this manner is forging a connection. And it's really satisfying, um, I think, to, uh, to continue on, along that vein. It really does change the way, the way that you kind of, or at least for me, it changed the way that I kind of look at things. And it sounds like, sounds like it did the same for, for each of you as well, which I think is another reason why I was so attracted to your work. Um, because you can, you can kind of feel that there's a story, even though you don't know what the actual, uh, may not know the actual details or anything, but you can kind of right. feel that. And um, how, do you, how do you feel about that? You feel the same way, Annie? I so think, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And, it, you know, and I love that, you know, talking about the connections and everything, we just have to be open to everything. You know, you never know what's gonna come along. You just have to be open to experimenting. And that's what artists do. It's like, you know, let's give it a try, that sort of thing. Yeah. But um, yeah, absolutely, it's just, um, it's it's nice connecting to the past it's nice to that there will be something out there in the future that's gonna connect with us so we just keep going and now i remembered what i was going to say which actually is part of this conversation is that when you connect when you're when you're removed in some way maybe you didn't you didn't learn from the source and that's a that's a form of removal right it's a form of distance i think mm -hmm. distance sometimes helps you to see things in a different way Right. So if you were within that within that tradition, you may not be seeing things within the same way. That's there's certainly a gift to being within the tradition as far as getting learning your techniques, um, learning processes, learning the meaning behind things. But some degree of removal, I think, kind of gives you a different perspective and it allows you to kind of um move on from from that tradition but still be um still have that tradition centered within you that's what i was gonna yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well said oh man uh, go ahead annie we got one no, more no, no. and then we'll get to no, the no, I just said, well said yeah it was i can't good. believe it's already 150. <laughs> I did want to say one thing, Sky. thank you for bringing up um, that you can visit your books at various collections. And for people who aren't aware um, of artist book collections, many, many libraries, particularly university libraries, but also public libraries have um, artist book collections. You make an appointment, you go see whatever um, the book is, you can actually handle it, you can interact with it. Um, you have to keep it, you can't check it out or anything, but I think it's important that people know that when the books are in these collections, they're there to be, um, to be experienced. So thanks for, thanks for uh, bringing that up. Okay, now for our Q&A, let's see what we have here. And that's the chat, let me pull up. Can I pull up the Q&A? Oh, yes, we do. Um, oh, so the first one, the uh, tamale paper, can you tell us anything about Tell us more about oh. that tamale paper, Annie. Absolutely, and I'm so ready, because look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Grocery store. That, you know, I um, anybody can go into the art supply store and get paper, but I like to just look everywhere. What, you know, and <laughs> you can find tamale wrapper paper in the grocery store hanging with, um, you know, with spices and stuff. It's, um, you, when you're making a tamale, you wrap it up in the corn husk, but then a lot of people put the paper on the outside of it also. Um, but that's all it is. It's just this paper. It's uh, then this one is 36 sheets. I found a, bit, a larger version of it, which I can just tear it. It's um, it, uh, someone's asking if it's similar to deli paper. It kind of is, yeah. Uh, and parchment paper, but it's not the same. There's something, I don't know what's, what's in this thing. 
it's it, you know you can it still rips it's still a paper but um but somehow it holds up for some reason it's just paper um but my family i grew up making tamales with my family and so that, there's the connection it's a cultural thing i connected to it right away and when i saw it i thought i have to try that i really have to try that and that's what i always encourage other people to do it's like shop differently you know think about all these other things hardware stores and you know you never know what you might find which might, you might connect to and i just personally connect to tamale wrapper paper we never used the paper but i connected to it because we made tamales so it's just something you know inexpensive that you can if you find it you know you can use it in workshops so uh, you can use it try it you know that's if, it, if you connect to it it's that's but that's it's a cultural thing for me and that's why i knew i needed to use it Nice. Now, um, there's another one. Uh, Gail asked, are your books available for purchase? So I'm just going to say work in the books works. Annie, I'm considering yours as well as in Sky. Um, is your work available for purchase? Yeah, I have 12 books left of the 44 edition. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm selling directly from myself. So if anyone would like to purchase one, um, just email me and I can put my email in the chat. Okay. Annie? And with, with me, um, I show my work in, in you know, galleries and museums. That's usually where you can find them. Uh, consider that the, the dresses are life size. So if it's a size 12 pattern, think about how big it is. So it's not something that, you know, that I could just send through the mail. Um, they have to, they store, they just don't fold up because it's paper. You can't just keep folding it up. It would eventually just disintegrate. Um, but yeah, uh, you can always check my website to see uh, or Instagram to see where I'm showing if you want to see something because uh, I show in different places across the country and a lot here in this area. Okay. And my work is also for sale. Um, when... Um, when I have new work available, I introduce it through my newsletter. And so um, I get, I usually talk a little bit about the work and show it, uh, but yeah, so directly through me or, you know, sometimes I'll work, I'll work with um, a couple of galleries. If there's any, ever anything at a gallery, I'll, I'll ask, the per, I'll tell the person where it's located, but uh, most of it is it's through me as well. But um, let's see. Uh, Darcy asks, Annie, do you wax your cyanotypes or how and what do you use? Wax them? Mm -hmm. Is that the word? W-A-X? W-A-X. Yeah, no. W-A-X. Okay. No. Um, it's, just, it's just the paper. It's a cyanotype solution on the paper um, and printed that way uh, it, like you would on regular watercolor paper because uh, cyanotype can be done on regular watercolor paper also. Mm -hmm. um, so it just, it's the same process, but no, there is no other coating on it. It's still paper that can tear, um, you know, you have to be careful. Yeah, and it looks like there's heart, I don't see wrinkles, that, I mean, like a lot of wrinkles. So you, you must be a pro at handling. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, actually, if you look really close, you can see the wrinkles in them. Um, because uh, what I do a lot of times is I'll, I'll um, iron them on the reverse, but you can see the texture in it because oh, okay. I had to, you know, to make it, to make it uh, lay flatter, I do iron it on the reverse. Uh -huh. And of course that'll pick up the, the shape of the towel or the ironing board or whatever that I'm, that I'm ironing on. But it, it, yeah, it's, it, there is a texture to it when you get up close to it. Kind of, um kind of uh, embosses it a little bit. Yeah, it does. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, we've got um, Tiffany, Sky. how do you go about choosing your color and does it add meaning to your work conceptually? Um, not always, um, doesn't always mean certain things, but in Olnigit, it definitely did. I want it to kind of stay to like natural dye colors. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about the yellow root for the cover and then with the um, weavings, I wanted them to be more like, um, again, natural dye colors of like, um, like walnut and things that are more earth, earth toned. Mm -hmm. um, with my screen printing, I just, I like brighter colors. So I try to make that. I usually start with um, <clears throat> 
they call them gradients. So mm -hmm. I do like a four to five color gradient and then I cut my paper and then cut the other paper and then I weave them together. Oh, nice. And, and I noticed one of yours, I think it's in your show, it's, is it a sparkly pink? <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> Ooh. <laughs> what is it? I made that paper. Yeah. <laughs> I made it this oh. summer. I actually found out that the yellow paper is one of the hardest papers to make, to color oh. it that way. And so I felt really bad because when I was at WSW, um, Chris, the um, the manager, or like the, she's like the pro in the, Brent, in the book part. Uh -huh. she, she's magnificent. But um, she was making the paper for me while I was doing like the weaving and the letterpress and like all the other things. Mm -hmm. and, um, she kept coming back with like different samples and more samples and I was like it's not there yet it's uh -oh. not there yet and then I, uh -huh. I couldn't understand that it's like one of the hardest colors to make but um, when I took this um, paper making workshop I made the pink paper and I put um, mica in it so it's a micaceous mm. paper nice uh -huh. I have one that's like very subtle and then it goes to like intense wow mica. But I couldn't use the intense one because every time I'd cut it, it would just, it rip. Because oh, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That looks fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, that's one thing. I really uh, love the paper making. I hope that I can actually use like um, my own plant fibers in the future that from like the traditional basketry and so that I can make my paper out of that. And then it's almost like taking the traditional materials, putting it into paper and then weaving with that. So, so. Yeah, I love that. So I, um, not with basketry, of course, but um, since my parents both lived on farms, you know, thinking about, and I like plants too, and I have, I have always, well, not always, but <laughs> had a garden for years. <laughs> and so I, the idea of the plant and then taking the plant and using it in multiple ways within your art, within your work. I think that's just such a fascinating and I just really like the inclusiveness of it and how it just kind of just gets everywhere into the work. So that sounds really, I can't wait to see what you do with that, Sky. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, here's another one for you, Sky. Are your weaving patterns symbolic? Yeah. Yeah, they definitely are. Um, mm -hmm. Recently, a lot of them were about childbirth and uh, breastfeeding and becoming a new mom for the, mm -hmm. like, the first time during mm -hmm. a pandemic. So oh. a lot of, uh, a lot of hard days. Me and my partner, uh, well, I don't think our child even met anyone until he was probably eight months old or, <laughs> or was, he, he wasn't babysat by anybody until he was almost a year old. So wow. Yeah. Yeah. You got so you got a lot of bonding time. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> and let's see. And congratulations. Huh? Oh. I said and congratulations. Yes. <laughs> yes, on the new edition and the new show. <laughs> yes. Um, so Na Naomi is asking Annie, did you make any identity paper paper masks during the pandemic? I did not. I thought about it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, sometimes I don't want to put bad events into my artwork. It's like bad energy. That's what it's. It's a superstition for me. Um, in the the last administration I had you know I I was invited into a show and so I had to use an image I used as small of an image as I could mm -hmm. of that person um, in the the piece that I made I just feel like I'd rather um, even if it's um, you know uh, it, it's been so I've had some tragic events that I've put into my artwork but it's not um, uh, but there's just sometimes I don't want to put that sort of thing into my into my work. I am I am making now that you know we're a little bit further along. Um, I, um, I've I've been experimenting with masks, and the masks that I made for myself were all a little bit different than what other people were wearing. I found cloth with words on them and stuff, and you know just confusing things because I really enjoyed wearing the masks, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it didn't go into the artwork, but it may it's um i've been playing i've been playing with masks 
So it, it, it may come out later. Well, can you believe that it's two o'clock? <laughs> this has been fabulous. Once again, I so enjoyed your conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I have a couple of screens here. Let me share um, to close out. Um, and thank you all for your questions. I see there's a lot more and um, uh, we'll have to see what we can do to get um, to get to, to, to those again <laughs> after, after this. But I want to uh, thank each of you for attending today's textile talk. Thank you, Sky. Thank you, Annie. And thank you for so to Sakwa for hosting us. And a special thanks to our sponsors. Um, the recording for this textile talk will be available um, within the next week on the Textile Talk YouTube channel. Next Wednesday, Textile Talks will be hosted by Studio Art Quilt Associates and artists Jim Hay, Rivka Hamdani, and Connie Roman will speak about work they're exhibiting at Connections, the SACWA Global Exhibition. The episode will be moderated by Martha Seelman. Thanks everyone and goodbye. Bye Sky, bye Annie, thank bye, you. Bye, thank you.